All right, so sorry to disappoint anyone who thought this talk might be in German. All I can say is guten tag. Um, so about ERD flowcharts and other documentation. And I think my clicker doesn't work. Now it works, okay. So what this presentation is not about, so th if this is what you s expect to have, you will be disappointed. It is not a full analysis and design course. It is not a demo of modeling tools and how to use them. Uh, it's not a detailed explanation of symbology of the different diagrams. Uh, you can always find it in books. So I will just show you an overview of the different diagrams. What it is really about is what diagrams serve what purpose, <coughs> how to tie the diagrams together. So uh, different diagrams as they serve different purposes, uh, how to go from one to another and what, what they represent and how to use that in a real project. So some real world examples and mostly examples. So I will just show you how to use them. Uh, my name is Anna Felina. I uh, organize a PHP Quebec user group in Montreal. Uh, I also organize a non-for-profit conference called CONFU. Um, at my company, FULAB, I write code. I train and supervise programmers. So I'm, I, I do a lot of presentations and I, I, I coach them. I uh, review code, I write tests, I enforce methodologies. So why do people not write documentation? I mean, first, first of all, it's boring. I mean, nobody likes writing, uh, drawing something nice, and then it gets out of date. So you have to draw them all over again. You have to read your code and then adjust. Uh, there's no point. Um, so if you're going to draw some, some nice diagrams and nobody reads it, then there's no point. Um, and also people don't know where to begin. So I want to draw something, I want to write documentation, where do I start? So I'm going to show you how to start um, with a project. Oh, also uh, Lean and Mean, that is uh, some, some people tell me, oh, we're doing Agile here, so you know we're, we're stripping all the documentation. Well, in that case, you're, you are lean, but you are not mean because you cannot achieve the same result without documentation. Uh, so, and it doesn't always have to be boring. So let's, let's take this theoretical flowchart. Uh, you get a software update notification. Uh, and then you think, well, do I have bugs in my software? Mm, if yes, of course you will update. But if no, okay, do I have some spare time for it to download the updates, install, re, re, uh, restart my application, perhaps even restart my operating system? If the answer is no, then you know you click next week, and next week the same things happen. So, so this is an example of a flowchart, which can represent much more than just programming. It can represent uh, any logical process, basically. In this case, it's software-related, but it doesn't have to be. So the real problem why people do not write documentation is because um, they don't understand the diagrams. Uh, people don't know. Um, they, say they serve no purpose. They're not helpful. They're just there to exist, um, and they're not helping us write the, the code. <clears throat> and also people mistake diagrams for the waterfall model, as I mentioned about lean and mean. Uh, a diagram doesn't mean that you, uh, you have to, to have a very linear process, and then you cannot go back uh, in time. It can be very dynamic. Um, and also people often have inadequate tools, which they fight against. And because of that, they waste a lot of time, it gets frustrating, and because documentation is already difficult to start with, um, having inadequate tools uh, doesn't help. And also, sometimes the wrong people will choose those tools, so the developers will not, will not uh, enjoy using them. Um, also, some companies are afraid to pay for tools. I mean, there are, there's a lot of open source software there, but some tools uh, you have to pay for, and you know, if there's a license cost, then Company should assume it um, if it will help people write documentation efficiently. Uh, so I will use as an example a conference management software because I organize Confu, so I wrote, wrote this in-house uh, application, and I will just show you a small portion of it uh, with diagrams. This is a use case diagram. Um, you don't have to represent it this way. It can also be just a bullet point. Only here it's visual and you can play with it and you can discuss it in a meeting. You can say, here are the features we want, basically. Uh, we want people to submit a proposal uh, because our call for papers is an open process. People submit proposals, others um, vote on, uh, the attendees would vote on proposals uh, or basically anyone on the web can vote for them. 
uh, then the organizer will select uh, the proposal and this turns into uh, a list of sessions and a li list of speakers. So this is basically a list of all of your features. It's very, very easy to draw and forces you to think about uh, perhaps some packages that you will use. Proposals will be uh, uh, an area of your, of your um, perhaps a module of your application. <coughs> It defines the scope of your application. This is called an um, entity relationship diagram. Uh, when you start, it, it's, it looks just like that. Um, and you can also, if you're working with customers, you can actually show this to them. It would make sense to them. And you can, you can discuss your database structure in this way with a customer, with a non-technical person, because they understand, yes, we have a user in our system and the user um, submits sessions, which will, well, sessions in this case are also proposals, it's just a flag in the system that turns them, as they, as they get selected, it turns them into um, actual sessions, which are related to events. So we have events with multiple sessions, and other users will be able to vote on those sessions. Uh, and what, what you do is uh, you start with the names and relations, which will correspond to your uh, database tables. So this way you, you document your database before you write it. Mm. Sorry. And then, um, just a, a little bit about symbology. Uh, what that means is there's a one, so um, a session can belong to one event, and an event can have zero or more sessions. There are other notations as well you can use. Uh, this is my preferred. Um, after you've done that, uh, you, can, you can define your um, IDs, your identifiers. Uh, an event has an ID, session, a user, but then the vote uh, is actually a combination of, uh, it's a composite key, and each of them is a foreign key to the session ID and to the user ID. So this is straightforward, you, you already know this stuff, it's just a way to represent it, instead of opening a, a document and starting to write in bullet point and indent, it's not quite visible, you don't see the relationships, and in this way um, you can slowly build your system uh, and when you're ready, you can just um, create a little uh, plugin, for example, for your application and export that in an actual database. Uh, something you need to know here, if you're wondering about uh, why there's a dotted line and a solid line, a solid line is identifying, uh, the other one is non not identifying. What it means is that you can identify the vote uniquely only if both parents exist, right? If the user doesn't exist, there, there's no user ID, you cannot identify this. So basically, what, what, what it creates is um, called an associative entity. So it creates, it, it associates to a session to a user, basically with optional data afterwards. And non-identifying means that an event can, be, can exist separately, a session cannot exist separately, but it can be identified directly. So you don't need to be aware of the event in order to identify your session because a session has already an ID. Just a little detail. And then you keep expanding, you add all of your columns. Once you have your, your uh, uh, identifiers, you can, uh, a vote can have the, the vote itself, which is perhaps plus one, minus one, a creation date. So you can perhaps uh, say uh, to a speaker who submitted, you can say, well, uh, since you last logged in, here are the new votes you got. So that can be useful. Uh, you know, just same old, same old passwords, password salt, first name, last name. Uh, CFP means call for papers, so it automatically opens and closes the call for papers based on those dates. Uh, so you think about all the, all the features you need based on the, um, when you look at the um, use case diagram in the beginning, <clears throat> you know exactly what features you want to implement, and based on that you would require certain, um, certain fields in your database. So is selected is a boolean which we will use later um, to distinguish a proposal from an actual session. Now a data flow diagram is I guess the least known um, especially for those who are self-taught. Uh, so if people learn programming by themselves they might not have seen that very often. So what we see on this screen is a context diagram, or also called a level zero diagram. So your entire application is one black box. It's called the conference software. And around it, you plot your um, external entities. So all of the people that will 
uh, c communicate with the application. Uh, these are taken directly from the uh, actors on the use case diagram. You, see, you saw the little people. So a speaker is slightly different from an organizer, not from the database perspective, but from uh, a features perspective. Um, so you have an attendee organizer, and then you have data flowing in and out. So an attendee gets uh, a list of proposals, see in the middle there, proposals preview, and then once he sees the list of proposals, he's going to pick one. He's going to say, oh, I want to see that at the next conference. So he presses plus one, and that registers as a vote and goes, flows, the data flows into the conference software. And what's interesting is that this way you document all of your data so you know exactly uh, what flows in and out. You can already think about some unit tests you can write. Um, <clears throat> all of the outputs, which is interesting, are, um, and I might be able to... I don't know if I can show it on this one. Okay. Yeah, so the outputs, as you see there, can be seen uh, in an MVC. Uh, is anyone familiar with MVC? Okay. So in the case of MVC, what you will have is these will co correspond probably to your views. So these will be the screens you will see. You will, for each one of these uh, uh, arrows that point to the external entities, you will have a screen. And these screens, you can then already think about wireframing. Um, so the speaker's preview, you will have you need a screen for this and that. Um, everything that goes in and out perhaps will uh, map to a controller. So you can already begin really to imagine your system without writing a single line of code. You already know exactly uh, what it's going to look like in terms of code. Um, right. And if, if you could just... Right, I show this. If you could count the number of inputs and outputs, how many do you get? Anyone? Or you can just shout the number. How many inputs and outputs total? Five outputs. Okay. Just, just give me the total. Eight. Eight? Okay. So this is an important number to remember. There's eight of them. Um, on other diagrams, we will make sure that it matches. Um, I will show you how. So when we take that black box and we explode it into multiple processes, uh, these, in, in turn, are also black boxes which you can explode further. But on level one, you have to make sure that you have all of your external entities and you have the same number of inputs and outputs. Right? So you still have eight of them. Uh, you still have your proposal form that goes to the speaker uh, when he submits, or rather we were talking about attendees, right? Uh, so number three is the proposals preview that goes to the attendee and then the attendee will register the vote. And that will go into process number two, which is vote on proposals. And here you can start adding new, um, new things. You can add one or more databases that you're going to use. Uh, in our case, it's just one, the event database. And, and from the processes, you have other data flowing into those, um, it, perhaps into other processes, but mostly into a database. Uh, so they, they're, they're somewhat independent in this sense. Um, <clears throat> So what happens is that um, the, these, uh, everything you see uh, revolving around the event database you would not have seen on the previous level. But as you explode, you can add more data and you can, you can see what you're going to need to collect in your forms. And let's just zoom on, sorry, I'm skipping a lot. Uh, let's zoom on number two. We explode it further. So when uh, we are handling proposals for the conference, um, one of them so will generate a list of proposals. So there's only one arrow that can come in and out um, at this level. Uh, well, not necessarily un un until you explode. But if this is the lowest level of process, you have to make sure that only one thing comes in and one thing comes out. If it doesn't come out, it perhaps means that it was stored. So it can come in if it's stored, um, but you have to be able to take it out somewhere else. and. Um, if you, can, if you can do that in the same process, um, explain how you store that, then it will be much more uh, helpful and easier to, to read. Anyway, uh, as you um, send a, basically it will uh, take the rated, uh, rated proposals out of the event database, uh, process it there, create the nice view, uh, do any calculations it needs, um, <clears throat> and then s send the the, the ready to use preview to the attendee. And when the attendee is ready, he's going to vote. And then it will validate the, uh, the vote. 
and once it's validated, it's going to flow into the event database. <coughs> so here you see one input, one output. So if we look at the previous page very quickly, you see number two vote on proposal was uh, one input and one output. Don't consider the ones inside, only the ones that flow to the external entities. You can read more about this, this is just an overview. Um, I'm not going to go uh, much more in depth about that. Uh, some of the common mistakes people uh, make when they uh, design data flow diagrams is that um, they don't store data, so or rather they don't document how data is going to be stored. So they forget tables, they forget um, uh, they forget to 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 write that code later, perhaps. Um, when something flows into, for example. Um, See here, we're storing it. So when it, a vote flows into the, the process, it comes out, it's stored here. And from here, you can then extract it for other processes. Uh, what a black hole is, basically data gets sucked in, as in a black hole, and never escapes. So you just put data there and it disappears. It, there's no way to get it out. And, and this is bad because you want, you want to be able to extract data that you stored. It's like having a lot of logs which you never analyze. So you have to think about that and make sure that all the data that you store is actually, um, is actually used. But even if it's not stored, a process where you have, for example, when you think about it as a function, so you pass parameters to the function, you do some calculation, you don't store anything, it doesn't go anywhere, it's just processed there and dies with the process when it's done. So when, uh, when your uh, code exits, nothing, nothing happened. It didn't go to another process. So you just lost data basically or lost processing power. A gray hole is when it's, it's somewhere, it's not quite a black hole, so data does come in, but what comes out is um, not justified but what, by what came in. So for example, if you want to process a credit card transaction and then you enter um, your first and last name, this is not enough to have a process transaction coming out because you also need the credit card number, you also need the expiry date and um, uh, CCP, I think, or whatever that code is. Sorry? CSV. CSV code, yeah. I don't know why I think CCP. Oh yeah, because I go to this restaurant in Montreal, it's called Checkpoint Charlie, so CCP just popped into my head. They make very good schnitzel though. <laughs> and spontaneous generation is the exact opposite of a black hole. It just generates, so nothing comes in and suddenly stuff comes out. You cannot, this cannot happen in, in real life. So you have to be careful not to have arrows flowing out but nothing coming in. Um, so, w once you start adhering to those rules, you suddenly start seeing uh, mistakes before you even start writing your application. So you see, this, this will not work because I need more data. In order to get this data, I need to create a form to collect it. So it forces you to think about all of these details and when you start coding, you actually have everything you need and you don't need to, to worry about requirements anymore, you just go ahead and you code it. Uh, so all, all, the, all of the thought process is done at this stage. And, and this can be very iterative. Uh, I mean, you can you can create it once, and then you add a new you have a new feature request. So you just go, you edit there, and you think about it, and and you see the impact on the entire system. And after that, you can go ahead and um, <coughs> uh, code it. Now, from here comes the fun part: is the flowchart. Uh, flowcharts. Uh, there's always a start and an end. It doesn't always have to be called this way, but uh, in my case, I I start and I get data. So this, um, I think it's called a parallelogram um, stuff. So basically you start there, the attendee submits a vote. And is the call for papers open? If it's not, then you will send an output, which is an error. So you would say, I'm sorry, but the call for papers is not open. Uh, they shouldn't be able to submit in the first place, but you know, you can always simulate a post request uh, to, to anywhere and you don't want people to start messing with your database. So you're going to display an error because continuing makes no sense. <clears throat> if the call for papers is open, you make sure that the person voting is not a speaker of that particular proposal because you don't want people liking their own status, right? When, when you go to Facebook and somebody posts something and then five, five minutes later there's no likes, okay, so he's going to go like it just so that if you sort by uh, most popular stories, it bumps up. So yeah, look, it is actually funny. You should really see, you should really click on that image. 
Um, and then uh, you continue. If, if everything checks out, you store the valid vote. So the square here is a process. And then another output, display confirmation, and then you just end the process. So it, you see there's two ways to get to the end. So don't think that it's a linear process. You have decisions everywhere. And whatever the decision, you end the process. It's just that you can have different outputs. It's not always the same output. And this allows you to uh, document your logic. So the, this is really the business logic, because thinking about um, is, is that person a speaker forces you to think whether you want people to like their own or vote on their own proposals or not. So, so this, is, this is, has nothing to do with programming at this stage. It's really you, you think about what you want, uh, how you want your application to function, what, um, what constraints do you want to impose on your user. Um, yeah, and you also have different kinds of flowcharts. They, they're called um, physical process charts. They use similar symbology, but a lot more other symbols. Uh, physical processes can be, for example, in a factory, you have somebody uh, having it with a bin and takes paper out, and then he moves it to a different bin, and this is, uh, this is like requests of, of uh, things to be processed today. So today you're going to create uh, this and this uh, piece on, on, that, uh, on that machine or on that conveyor belt. Um, <clears throat> so you, you can also document that, but I won't go into details, we'll just stick to software for now. Yeah, inputs and outputs. Um, Mockups, also called wireframes, are also fun. So as I said, everything that flows out uh, can be seen, not always, because external entities are not necessarily users. They can be other systems. So if you're having, a, if you have an API, somebody will consume your API. It's not quite, uh, there, there's nothing to design, it's just to send the data. Uh, in this case, the proposals preview is going to have to look like something. So to, dis def uh, to see what it is going to look like, you can use an application to wireframe your, your stuff. So for example, you would have, um, you can also think about your URL, what the title will be, um, how it's going to look uh, on the page. Um, you're going to have a list of sponsors for your conference uh, on this side. You're going to show how many votes they got. Um, yeah, so, so this, this part becomes a lot more fun um, for a lot of people. Function reference, did I mention everything? Yeah. The function reference, um, you don't necessarily have to do that, but uh, some people do, especially when you, um, you, have, you, you write open source software that you want others to build upon, for example, a framework. <clears throat> and in that case, you would want to, or maybe it's a programming language. For example, if you create a programming language, uh, every function needs to be um, uh, documented. So you would have a session, which is our presentation, basically. Um, you want a, um, a function called is selected because we've seen from the flowchart we're asking is it selected. So why not make this condition uh, a simple function? So you can just ask for it. Um, mail confirmation, for example, when somebody submits a presentation, you might want to be able to uh, send an email with the text so that if they, um, they can no longer access it for some reason or for next year, they perhaps might want to reuse it or maybe reuse that same proposal to apply at another conference uh, or just to say that, you know, we've received your proposal, it's fine, so that they don't come on the day of the conference realizing, oh, I thought I submitted, but apparently I haven't. I haven't completed the process. That happened to us a few times. Uh, so this is why we have uh, email confirmation. Now, <clears throat> you can check the logs to see. Uh, so if you were going to uh, unit test all of that, you can check the logs, for example, to see if an email was actually sent. Uh, but, you know, if you trust your system, you would normally have uh, other approaches. Without actually sending a mail, you would uh, verify the content <coughs> and the destination. Uh, saving a vote. Uh, here is something interesting, so I'm also going to talk a, a little about best practices. If you're going to unit test that, <coughs> when you save a vote, you don't just give it a vote, you also give it a user. Because when you're testing, you don't want to uh, simulate a login, handle sessions, and then, uh, so just so that it can pull that information from the session. So you can have a function that receives that as a parameter, which makes it a lot more, uh, a lot easier to, to test. Uh, yeah, so, uh, save vote, for example, uh, that's where you would check if um, the call for papers is open or not. Um, 
if it's uh, if it's the same per the the speaker is the person is actually the speaker so you compare the user id to the speaker id of the presentation and if it's if it's if it's uh, if everything checks out then it will uh, will save it will return true otherwise it return false and in your uh, controller perhaps you will be able to uh, intercept that and, and show the appropriate error message or confirmation message. Now, commenting on your source code. That's probably the first reflex of everybody who thinks about documentation is, you know, write meaningful comments. I'm not going to go into details about what makes a comment meaningful. Um, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of uh, blog posts about that on the web. There's probably books on it. so. You can, you can check that out. So you have inline comments, uh, so they're simple and short explanation, hopefully not describing exactly what the line just did. I think on Stack Overflow they had, uh, or some similar uh, site, they had a list of the, uh, the, funniest, uh, the funniest comments they've ever seen, the most useless comments. So there was an I++ and then there's a comment, increment I by one. Just in case somebody doesn't know what plus plus is. Um, so the comment was actually longer than the, the code that it was describing. So make sure they're, they're meaningful, uh, don't just, don't overuse them. You also have descriptive blocks. Uh, this is uh, PHP. I did PHP because I, I presented this at the PHP conference first and forgot to remove all um, references to PHP. So forgive me if you're using a different language. I by no means mean to discriminate. Uh, so, but comments look like this in, in many languages. Um, so they're, they're commonly used above functions. Um, some people use them in, inside the code to comment a very big block. If you have a big block, and I said this on the, on the last line, you have a big functions with a lot of, of comments inside them. So you would have a, a block of code and on top you comment what the block does. Perhaps this block can be if it's, if it's a single unit, you can export this into a function. So just take it out, make it a function. This way you don't have to write as many comments. Um, and above functions, you can also use annotations with PHP Documenter or other um, tools. You can extract those annotations and automatically perhaps generate um, an API reference, uh, which is a good way to document, but then you will have to fill in with examples on how to use your, uh, your code. Um, yeah, and always comment when it's fresh. Don't wait until the next day to comment on that or when you, you don't know what it's, it's doing, then you're gonna think about it and find out because sometimes you will never find out what it does. Especially if it's a regular expression, sometimes it's so hard to read that it's, it's a very good thing to comment when you wrote it and you explain exactly what it does. Um, otherwise you'll just forget, you know. And sometimes you would, you would get into this code uh, two years later or maybe you know you were coding when you were drunk, and then the next day, like, what did what did they just do here? I don't know. It's supposed to do something. It works, but I have no idea why. Um, you can also comment on things such as uh, incomplete functions. Like, so you have a function, it uh, it just returns true by default, uh, just so you could uh, test it correctly in the system, and then um, you want to actually complete it. But just if you leave it there, if you're if you're, you know, checking out um, of the office, you know, just just write a comment on top and say, uh, oh, "This is incomplete, by the way." Or if you know for sh for a fact that there is something doesn't behave as expected, but you haven't found a solution yet, just say, "Well, this function is broken. I know." So if you f you find a fix, fix it. Don't assume that it's supposed to work this way. So sometimes you have to, um, to be nice to other developers as well who have no clue why it's not working and they're calling it. Is it supposed to do the, the, what, what it's doing? <coughs> so putting it all together, as, also known as the manual. So when you create open source projects, this is, this is very um, important, but also in, in case of, even if you have three developers on your team, it's also um, interesting to have a manual. So all of, all of these diagrams, you have to be able to put together with examples, usage examples. Um, and this brings us back to high school essay writing um, because we're going to write a manual. So how do we write a large text? Uh, we've all learned that in high school, but you know, it's, it's good to refresh, uh, <clears throat> to refresh the memory sometimes. So, to write a manual, this is, this is my approach, you can use another. Uh, what I do usually is I would define chapters. 
example, I would have the scope, the database, the processes, the mockups, and then I would list classes and usage, so like a function reference. So this is, this is how you use this class, this is how you call it. Um, uh, here are some examples of, of different edge cases you can use. Um, the mockups later become screenshots, so uh, the manual is to be maintained throughout the project. And at first you write mockups, you can always put it, put it together. You can, yeah, so you put it together in the beginning and then after you have wrote, written your application, you have actual screenshots that you can take. And you just replace the wireframes with um, actual, actual screenshots. <clears throat> and of course it will eventually get out of date, but you have to maintain it. And you have to take turns as well. Uh, make sure that somebody else can maintain your code. If somebody else can write documentation for your code, <coughs> that means that you have succeeded somewhere. Uh, after you've done that, I'm sorry, I guess it's very loud for the people uh, back home. It's their problem, I guess. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> <coughs> so, um, what you do after you define your chapters, within each chapter, you write topics in bullet points. At least that's how I do it. And then um, I add all the diagrams. So here's a bullet point, this is, this is what it's supposed to do. Here's a diagram. Bullet point, here's a diagram. And after that, uh, under each bullet, I expand it into a paragraph. So I just write one paragraph about you know, what it's supposed to do. And then I move topics and chapters around. Uh, I move topics and chapters around and um, I, just to make sure that it makes sense to the person reading it that when read in order, it's actually, it's actually useful. Make sure that every chapter is actually separate from the other chapters, so that if a person jumps, uh, especially if you do an open source project like a framework or any kind of platform, people will uh, look for solutions and they don't want to read the entire manual, so if they jump somewhere, it contains enough information for them to be able to... Um, <coughs> sorry, to be able to, to use that. Um, and once you're satisfied with the way your chapters are organized, and you can fill in with details and, and add uh, exa code examples. And that's about it. And, and that, that makes usually a very good manual, so it's a very good start. It's, it's not as hard as it sounds when you follow steps and you make it simple and, you, and then you expand. So instead of writing huge paragraphs for every chapter and then having chapters with absolutely nothing in them, you just start, start small and expand every point. So how much do you write? That's interesting. So um, how, much uh, how much code should we write? So let's say we have two applications. So you built uh, an application or you're building uh, uh, for your grandma uh, a platform to publish her recipes versus Facebook. So which one is more complex? Where would you write more documentation? Anyone? <laughs> I guess that's pretty obvious, of course. More documentation for Facebook. Um, security requirements, same thing. Uh, if you have the IAFIS, which is in the United States, the IAFIS fingerprints uh, system, that has more security. You don't want your um, fingerprints to be extracted from there because, you know, I don't know, you, you were driving while drunk, so they got your fingerprints for whatever reason. You don't want them to end up in the wrong hands. Um, so you would write more documentation to protect that. Or you don't want people, you know, to abuse that in any way. Uh, financial impact, um, <clears throat> once again, grandma's recipes have no financial impact or maybe they could be a little bit. Um, maybe there's some ads running. Uh, uh, Forex currency trading, uh, so you, you trade currencies, you want to make sure that uh, you don't miss a penny somewhere, otherwise, um, or a cent, sorry, I'm, I'm in Europe, I have to adjust. Um, so uh, you don't want you, you don't have to you don't want to have any mistakes there. Um, so you would write more documentation in that case. Uh, team size yourself versus twenty developers, perhaps perhaps five hundred, perhaps more. The more developers you have, normally you would write more documentation <coughs> because you don't want five hundred people calling you and saying, Anna, what is this supposed to do? Why did you write it this way? Well, it's okay. Just go read the manual. It's all there. Start there. Well. Not in a bad sense, but you know, go read the manual. If, if it's not there, then ask me. But at least with a the manual, they, they have a reference. They can, they, can, they can find information. If there's no manual, well, of course, people are going to bother you. 
if people are in the same office, uh, it's much easier to get information. If people are um, remote, perhaps across the ocean with a different time zone, if somebody is for example, if I'm on the East Coast uh, in North America, somebody is in India, then it's a lot more difficult to uh, communicate because you almost never get to be in the office when the other person is in the office because it's so many hours of difference. Uh, so they're always sleeping when you're working. So in that case, you would also want a little more documentation. <clears throat> uh, good documentation will make your software easier to build and to maintain. It makes your team more effective because nobody bothers each other, so you don't want to be disturbed every time. You can also, it's very interesting, you can discover new features before you implement. Um, so because you, you, you do your uh, documentation properly, sometimes you think, well, <clears throat> I only need to add this little thing and I can have a whole new feature at no cost. <coughs> Whoops, sorry. I just wanted to grab something from my eye. <sighs> because I had this cold for a long time. And uh, now I think I'm getting at the end of my uh, capabilities. <clears throat> and this is, this is something that's not related to documentation in software, but this is what I do. Uh, for example, to create my slides or whatever, I uh, create mind maps. Mind maps is a very cool uh, tool, allows you to, um, to help you in your thinking process. So whenever you're, you're, you want to think about how you want to organize your topics, um, you, can just, you can just write them in, in this way. Um, I, I know somebody who actually has his entire life in a mind map. So every branch is an aspect of his life. So uh, meetings or whatever, um, his presentations that he's giving at conferences, um, whatever um, stuff he wants to buy for his cats maybe. And so he has all of these branches and he can just, you know, with software he can close, collapse the branches and just open the ones you need. So it's, it's a very powerful tool, powerful enough for people to learn to put their entire lives in it. <clears throat> and uh, I strongly recommend that you get yourself a systems analysis and design book if you haven't uh, uh, had the class for in college, for example. And also a UML book uh, will be very useful to understand all the symbology, some more examples in there. Um, so the next steps, I will tweet these slides, so just check, uh, check me on Twitter. And you can also follow this link, bit.ly slash Anna-docs, or you can just scan this QR code, will bring you to the page where uh, on Froscon site you can leave comments. So whatever you liked, you didn't like, maybe you expected something to, to see something you didn't, uh, what uh, you wanted me to cover perhaps, and it makes for better conferences, so it's very useful for the Froscon organizers to see if they should invite me back next year, or something like that, uh, but also for us to improve content. And, you know, since it's so hard to ask questions at the end, so I will, I will actually tell you what questions to ask. Uh, ask me... <laughs> <laughs> see? I'm glad you're awake. So ask me which uh, modeling software I use. Can somebody ask me that question? <laughs> <laughs> Come on, don't be shy. Yes. Yes, okay. So I use uh, two software, actually, Asta, which is pretty powerful, and Balsamic. Uh, Asta for everything mind maps and all the diagrams, and Balsamic for uh, wireframes. Uh, as, uh, they both have, um, uh, the, they're both, both commercial products. Asta has a, um, I think, uh, a free to use uh, collaborative tool, uh, but they're, I think, a $300 for a lifetime license, I believe. You have to check it out. And Balsamic is a little less expensive, I believe. Works only on the Mac? No, it, actually, all of them work on all platforms. So even on Linux, and which is really cool. Yeah, so it works on all platforms. And Asta actually also has an iPad version, so. Um, I'm not an Apple fan, uh, really. I'm, I have a Mac, but I have a Toshiba at home. I'm going to switch to that soon. <laughs> I'm going to install Ubuntu on that. All right, thank you. Any more questions? Yes. All right, uh, thanks. thanks for the presentation. Could you tell more about what you actually do back and where you're from? Oh, OK. Well, I can talk about myself. Oh, uh, the question was, Thank you for reminding me. 
I forget. Um, so the question was, could I talk more about myself, what I do? Um, I like to put pictures of myself on slides like this. Um, but, so I write code, I write mostly PHP, I write uh, JavaScript. In the past I've done Visual Basic and, and a little bit of COBOL and I've done um, ActionScript 1, 2 and 3. I like not to talk about ActionScript 1 because this was really horrible, but now it's a little better. Uh, so other than writing code, I, uh, I go to companies and I help them with their teams um, to get better. So they don't always hire experts because experts are hard to come by. So they would hire instead um, junior or intermediate developers and I will bring them to a, a better level. So now they can automate deployments. I don't need to worry about them. Yes. Why pre-UML? Uh, why do you present mainly pre-UML uh, notations? Why do I present UML specifically? Pre-UML. I'm not quite sure what you mean. Yeah, okay. So, so the question is why I use uh, some of the um, older notations. Uh, that's why I learned. That's what I present. That's what, what I'm more comfortable with. Uh, there are other diagrams you can you can do, of course. So if you buy a modern book, you might have different diagrams, but these work very well, I believe, um, at least in my case. Yeah. Anyone else? All right, yay! <laughs> Thank you.